Some of you have a really good guess as to what this is. And most of you are wrong. But some of you, just from this angle, are right. Yes, this is an Apple machine. But it is not a Mac Pro. That'd be x86. And too easy for this channel. This is the G5 PowerPC machine. Now, this particular machine was given to me by someone who knows that I love PowerPC very much and it has a specific purpose. This is actually going to replace the Sun server, like the web hosting duties. Uh, a little bit of backstory on that. Basically, after moving here, uh, Chris decided that my Sun server draws too much electricity and wanted me to replace it with something. And I guess I don't blame him because technically it's the members in the geek group that pays for electricity. So we should try and use as little as possible. I figured this would be a pretty good solution. It keeps with my theme, in, as in not being x86. It's a very powerful machine, which we will get into here in a minute, and does what I needed to do. So, the Sun server will never be completely replaced. This, this has some caveats to it. The Sun server just doesn't compare. You know, you can't really compare that machine and this machine. The Sun server will eat it up any day. I mean, that thing will handle 100,000 simultaneous web connections. This, probably not so much. But it's good temporary it's a good temporary solution until I can contribute a hundred dollars a month for electricity. <laughs> so let's get into it. I'll start with the front. So you have a single DVD-ROM, it's also a burner. Power button, headphones, USB 2.0, FireWire 400. And that's it, that's all that's on the front of this thing. Now on the back, we have, we'll start from the bottom. Modem, Gigabit Ethernet, FireWire 800, FireWire 400, two USB 2.0, microphone, audio out, optical audio in and out. It's the Bluetooth antenna, that's for the wireless antenna. Power supply sits in the bottom. We have two fans, which you'll see in a minute, and how you open the case. Oh, and I got graphics and fiber channel, which we'll talk about. So to open the case on one of these, I believe it's the same on the Mac Pro. The Mac Pro is the same case. The only real differences are the Mac Pro has two optical bays and the layout back here is just a little bit different. So I'm gonna lift this and then you can just pop this out like this. Comes right off. It's a nice little lip in the bottom there. And you can see, we're not quite in there yet. So this, this clear plastic cover here, this is required. If you do not have this, the machine will not run for any extended period of time, say longer than 10 minutes. I learned this the hard way because I received this without this cover. And it kept turning off on me and I knew this cover was here because I'd go the Apple store back in the mid 2000s and they would have the side of the case off so you could ogle at the inside and it had this cover so specifically remembering that it was here you not know, seeing it missing pretty much gave me a clue as to why my machine kept shutting off and this doesn't really latch in here it just sits in here so you pull it out a little bit and then you lift it up and if you do this while the machine's running you will notice that the fans speed up and that's because this little tag right here blocks an optical interrupter that's down in that slot. And then once it detects that, then it knows that the thermal thermals are controllable from the system fans, which were designed to be very quiet and non-intrusive. So this particular machine 
this isn't the earliest revision and it's not the latest either. You'll notice that it's a PCI X machine and not PCI Express. The very last generation of these was PCI Express with DDR2 RAM. This is PCI X with DDR1. And so underneath here, which I might be able to take out, I have it kind of stuck in here in a way. No, I can't pull it out. And there wouldn't be much to see anyway. You can see the heat sinks here. There's two heat sinks. They're huge. They go back to about there. there. So there's a little space here. But they go about back to about here. And this front set of fans pulls out. Have a good night. Pull this out. And you'll notice that they're three bladed fans. And they don't spin very fast. You can't hear them at all when the machine's running. And it's designed, you know, in such a way that it's very quiet. I have all the RAM slots occupied. There is 4.5 gigs of RAM in here. All right, so with the fans removed, down here in the bottom of the case, you can see we have a PMU reset. This stands for Power Management Unit. Um, sometimes, if you can't get the machine to power on, or stuff acts a little bit weird on you, you could hit that button and kind of bring it back. Front panel connectors here. This is actually a power supply connector, so that goes down into the bottom of the case where the power supply hides. And when you dust these out, um, make sure that you get in there and get the power supply. Like if you have an air duster that actually fits in the little holes here, it's a really good idea to jam it through and actually blow out the inside of the power supply. People dust out the rest of the case and they forget about the power supply unit and then eventually that decides to overheat and lets go and then you have to replace that too. So, yeah, RAM sits here in front of the fans, fans sit here. Now you can see the heat sinks a little bit better. They're just massive. It's sexy. And that's pretty much all that's in the bottom. And here we have a card cage fan. So that would blow air across here. And I have an ATI graphics card in here. And one thing you'll notice is this goofy monitor connector that is not a DVI connector. That actually has a little bit, uh, it has a couple of extra features in it. Uh, one of which is, let's see if I can, yeah, I can show that. See that little extra slot there in front of the PCI X? That's a power connector. And so it supplies, I think it's like 28 volts or something like that, up to the monitor. And that does supply power even when the machine is in standby. So when servicing this, make sure you fully unplug it before dropping a screw onto the video card. Ask me how I know that one. And there's only the one, there's only the one power slot. So putting multiple graphics cards in here that will power the cinema displays is not really an option. But you can get a pretty beefy card that goes in there. Man, I just cleaned this out like a week ago. It's already all nasty. So that's all covered by the clear plastic. And that leaves us with up here. We have two 80 gig uh, SAS hard drives. I actually got these out of an, an Apple X serve and they're mirrored. So that way if one drive fails, I still have a backup. There's a fan here that cools the drive cage. And then there's a blower tucked away in there that covers or that moves air across the back side of the logic board or motherboard depending if you're an Apple fanboy or not. Apple calls it the logic board, which is <laughs> logical. And then there's exhaust fans here, one for each CPU, which usually spin about the same speed as the intake fans. And we'll get into that in a little bit too. So there's not really much else for room. There's a little small gap above the optical bay but that's usually, or that's more or less used to move fresh air in across so it can go across the hard drives. Now, the thing that makes this system special 
is the fact that it uses PowerPC processors. Apple worked together with IBM for a very long time to develop a processor for Apple desktop systems. It is the PowerPC architecture. It is, or it was 32-bit until the G4, I think. They went to 64-bit. And this is a 64-bit machine as well. It does, it, it is a RISC architecture, which stands for Reduce Instruction Set. And the idea is that instead of throwing instructions at a processor, a bunch of instructions, and the processor can just chew them up, they engineer these to process a few instructions very fast. So the idea being that if the software had a very complicated instruction, instead of the hardware being built into the CPU that would only get used once in a while, they could remove that hardware from the CPU and use the other transistors to execute those few instructions very, very fast. And this had performance advantages and floating point calculations and not so much in some other categories. By today's standards, this particular power piece power PC machine is fairly slow. There, there's no way around that. I mean, a Core 2 would probably blow this thing out of the water, but that's not necessarily the point anyway as far as me having it goes. So that's pretty much an overview of the inside of this thing. I, there are two front side buses in here. There's one for each CPU and they operate at exactly one half the clock speed. So this is a pair of two gigahertz processors. We have a pair of one gigahertz front side buses. And that's pretty much it. There is a wireless card that goes here, which obviously I'm missing. And I don't know where the Bluetooth hides, but it's somewhere over here. And I think that's missing as well. I don't really need wireless in a server. So I don't really care that much. So while I have this apart, we're going to install something in here. Let me retrieve that. Okay, so I had to look it up. The G4 power PC is 32-bit, which means this is the first 64-bit power PC Apple machine that was released. It got a little bit confusing for me because I have some other IBM power PC machines that are 64-bit and were just as old as G4 machines. And I guess one thing that's worth pointing out is that even though Apple and IBM work together and they put PowerPC processors in these, IBM disabled a lot of features that really made the PowerPC processor mighty, <laughs> I guess you could say. And so these are kind of the decaffeinated versions of the PowerPC processors. My, my IBM P5 uh, workstation has PowerPC processors in it that are two generations newer than what's in here. And the difference in speed between that machine and this one is ridiculous. I'd be using the IBM machine right now as a server if I had drive sleds for it. It is probably the fastest machine I've ever used a Linux distro on. It's, it's ridiculous. Like the the backplane is 42 gigabytes a second bandwidth or something like that, which is actually still pretty good by today's standards, all things considered. So here's what we're putting in here. You'll notice this box says Sun Microsystems on it. Now, this is for a Spark machine. And interestingly enough, Spark architecture, PowerPC architecture, share something in common. Uh, IBM developed Open Firmware. Open Firmware is a BIOS of sorts. It, it is a firmware. And so that's the code that first initializes the processors and brings the system online, initializes the hardware, and then boots the OS. Now, on a PowerPC machine, normally you say, okay, well, I have to get a only cards that are PowerPC compatible. If I was to put a regular PC SCSI card in here, the open firmware wouldn't be able to properly initialize it, and it may not show up at all. 
Sometimes, like a Linux install, it'll show up later in the hardware detection. Maybe some functions don't work quite, quite right. But I thought to myself, Sun uses open firmware, so I should be able to use Sun cards in PowerPC Macintoshes, right? Well, the answer is yes. This fiber channel card in here is actually for a Sun system. And this fiber channel card was hooked to this disk box through this cable. I actually had it working. Works fantastic. For, in the sense of power conservation, having a full disk box doesn't exactly conserve power, so Rocco loaned me a four terabyte hard drive, and that is where all my stuff is stored. And then that's gonna be plugged in via USB here, and I have everything that was on the Sun server. The only difference is the Sun server, if a hard drive breaks, I still got all my data. If this hard drive breaks, I'm screwed. So the Sun server will always maintain a backup copy of everything I have. So it will still get used, just not as often. So let's go ahead and put this card in. Let's open it up. Oh yeah. It's an LSI Logic SCSI card. It's PCIX 133, so 133 megahertz compatible. It's never been opened, so we're going to open it today. Uh, the things you can think you do with the things you think you can do with one hand. end up using your teeth. Perfect. That is a nice SCSI card. So I wanted to put SCSI in this machine so I could attach the tape back up and anything else that might be SCSI. It's an Ultra 320 SCSI card. Very nice SCSI card. So I'm gonna pull a slot cover and we're going to put this in. Okay, our card is now installed. You can see, well maybe you can see that. It is a low voltage differential, single-ended SCSI. We get two ports. And then we get two internally as well, which aren't going to really be used. I decided to pull the fiber channel card for now because it's not going to be used in this machine. Again, at least for a while. And if I do, and I'll put it in an available slot, but otherwise they can hang out and I can go in a different server. So that completes our upgrade. I think I'm gonna dust this out really quick again while I have it powered off and sitting on my desk. And then uh, we'll plug it in and take a look. Okay, I don't have a display hooked to it right now, so I won't be able to show you the boot process itself. I, the monitor I had hooked up to it, I stole and took home. So I have network, power, and the USB cable to the external storage. Hit the power button. Does just a quick rev up of all the fans. And now it's actually going to start to come up. I can actually hear some high frequency noise from the power supply when the machine is under a heavy load. I don't know if that's any indication of something potentially going wrong in the near future, but it does seem to do just fine. So that's going to boot up, and when it comes up, we'll log in and I'll show you the rest. So here we are logged into the system. I wrote a custom environmental monitor so we can actually take a look at how the temperatures and stuff work. And you can see it actually reports the temperature and the voltage, the watts each processor draws. 
and then you'll see in fan and exhaust fan. That's the intake and exhaust fan for each CPU specifically. And you'll notice it says 300. Now, that's not actually 300 RPM. That is the pulse width that is actually being sent to the fans. So if I was to load the system up a little bit, let me pull up another window here, and then I'll start up a VNC server, and we'll pull up a desktop. Type in my password. Start a VNC server on desktop 1. Now you can actually see the power draw goes up a little bit as we start to consume some power. And each processor can consume up to 90 watts. And I never really see it get above 150 degrees. Well, 150 degrees Fahrenheit is about where the sun system hangs out for temperature, so it's pretty comparable in that sense. And we'll pull up a desktop. Slide it over here. Now this is running Debian Wheezy, so the latest version of Debian. And the desktop is, is pretty much just the same. I was to pull up the system monitor. You see that that everything kind of pretty much works the same. Okay, so now we're back to this. This looks kind of weird because it's on a different font size. I go here. We have 50 or 74 gigs of space on the root file system. That's not bad because most everything else will be stored on storage, which isn't mounted right now. So if I go here, first off, did it detect our SCSI card? I actually think it did. So I'm on the big storage right now. I think it's... I think it's there. No. Nope. SDM. Fine. SDA, SDB. Looks like it's SDC. Okay. There we go. Our 3.6 terabytes is there now. So, cool. All that stuff's there. I haven't added that to the FS tab file yet. I've been working on getting this box set up. And top will show both processors. So that's that's pretty much where we're at with this. It's kind of just another Linux box, but of the power PC flavor. And here's this guy again. So, over the course of the next month, when I get around to it, I will actually run Unix Bench on this system, and then we can compare that with some of the other systems that I have, including a couple different Sun systems, a x86 system, and even the IBM machine, because I have ran the same benchmarks on the IBM power machine. And I really expect this to be in the middle of the range, I do expect the Sun Systems to beat it out. We'll see. It's going to be interesting. So I hope you enjoyed this tour of the Power Tower. It was the new main Doogie Labs web server for the time being. Uh, as far as the Sun server goes, I am not going to get rid of it. It will still be my primary means 
of data storage for all of my stuff. And as long as I get some money to pay the electricity for it, I'm gonna put it back up online because that thing is just awesome. Like, there's no getting around how awesome and nice it is to have that machine. In the meantime, I did set up my Sunblade 2500, so I still have a Sun workstation to do things with. And I don't think I made a tour video of that yet. So I'll have to give you a tour of my Sunblade. This is pretty awesome. So yeah, I hope you all enjoyed. We'll see you next time. Okay, quick follow-up. The server's installed. It's hiding back there. I added a monitor to my desk. And that's just for this. And I also installed Synergy, so when I move my mouse, it works here as well. Yay! Oh, that's kind of funny, it freaks out over here. works out pretty good. So you can now go to doogielabs.com and look at the server stats and actually view real-time info. And yeah, I had my tape drive and stuff hooked to it, which is broken, and I can't find the spare one. So that's pretty irritating. So yeah, serves up files and websites, and now I can start playing with SGI stuff and getting disks working. I hope you enjoyed this video. We'll see you next time.